Good morning, church. I feel good. I feel almost healthy this week. That's a good thing. I'm preparing my sermon this week, and my wife comes up to me and says, you know, J.D. Greer has been preaching on that same topic for the last two days, so I had to go on the radio or podcast and listen to J.D. Greer. He's a pastor at Summit Church in North Carolina. And so I thought, okay, I'll just steal his sermon and preach that. <laughs> no, actually, he came across the text that I'm going to use this morning and focused on the topic of busyness, since we're all busy, very busy. I'm going to take a little different look at the text this morning. We're in the Gospel of Luke. We're still in this series called Jesus, Who Cares? And you respond, hopefully, with, we care about Jesus. And so I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, grab one in the seat in front of you. Turn to the back. That's the New Testament. It's page 55, and you'll find Luke chapter 10. Last week, we looked at an incident in the life of Jesus where a lawyer, meaning one skilled in Old Testament law, came up to Jesus and asked this great question, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what did the law say? Because he was an expert in the law, and he says, basically what we call the, the two great commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, do this and you will live. And so then the lawyer said, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus goes into the story of the compassionate Samaritan, a guy who truly loved his neighbor. That was all last week. Now, the story that follows in chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, it, it's the story that ends this chapter. And some see a literary device called chiasm. Chiasm is the letter X, chi, in, uh, in Greek, and it means basically you have some issues like A proposition, B proposition, then you have B, and then back to A. And so here we have love God with all your heart, that's A. B is love your neighbor as yourself, that's B. A is love God, B is love your neighbor, and then you have a story about loving your neighbor, and now you're going to have a story about loving your God. Now, I don't know if it's true or not about this chiasm, but I thought it was interesting to mention. So let's look at today's text, beginning in verse 38 of chapter 10 in Luke. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and bothered about so many things, but one thing is necessary or needed, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Today's passage encourages us to choose what I'm calling the great over the good. Choose the great over the good. Back when I wanted to become a doctor so that you could call me Dr. Bob. I had to read this book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's an excellent book. It's about business. You can apply it to the church setting, but it's really why some companies make the leap and others don't. Good to great. He came out in the first chapter saying great, I mean good, the good is the enemy of the great. It taught you about what's called the hedgehog principle. Find out what your company is good at and focus on that. Not every company can do everything, so what you're good at, that's where your focus needs to be. Good principles for the church as well. Well, Chip Ingram comes along and says, well, I'm going to write a book called Good to Great in God's Eyes. Same kind of principles, but now applying it to Christians. And he's got ten practices that great Christians have in common. Now, I don't normally do book reports in church, but I do encourage you to buy those two books and read them. 
because I believe today's text, the Lord wants us to choose the great over the good. Would you join me in prayer before we start looking at the scripture closer? Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you how the Holy Spirit inspired men to write these words to begin with and how the Holy Spirit even today takes these words and opens our eyes, opens our minds, illuminates us to see the meaning of the text and most of all how we can apply it to our lives today. So Lord, help us to concentrate, help our minds to be open and our hearts teachable. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me make some initial observations about what I just read. This is not a story about women and kitchen work, okay? This is a story that centers around two sisters and Jesus. Now, these two sisters also have a brother who's named Lazarus. We find this out in John chapter 11, verse 1, when Lazarus gets sick, it says in verse 1 of John 11, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. So in verse 38, they were traveling along, and he entered a village. It's unnamed, but because of John's gospel, we know the name of the village is Bethany. Bethany. Bethany is located on the east side of the Mount of Olives. John eleven eighteen 18 says Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. So it's very close to Jerusalem, about two miles away. And Martha has this house there. John also mentions that Jesus had a close relationship with these three individuals, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. In fact, it says in John eleven five. 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You got the idea? Here's a house close to Jerusalem. Jesus travels to Jerusalem all the time, and he's got this friends, these friends in Bethany who seem to provide for their needs when they travel. He loved them. We read about this sibling group in John 11. This is all about the death and resurrection of Lazarus. We read about this sibling group in John chapter 12. I want to just read a few verses there. In John chapter 12 it says, Now Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, this is six days almost before he's going to be crucified, he came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, So they made him a supper there, right? They made him a supper there. And Martha was what? Serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. One of the disciples started to complain about the waste. Anybody know who that disciple was? It was Judas, the one who was going to betray Jesus. So here we have in John 11 the story of the, uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, and Martha and Mary play a big part in that story. And then in chapter 12, we see Mary anointing the feet of Jesus. Okay, back to our text. It says, they were traveling along in verse 38. Who's the they? Jesus and His disciples. Can we make the assumption that his disciples were there as well to the house in Bethany? All right. So if you're making supper, if you're making a meal, you're making it for how many people? Well, Jesus plus 12 plus maybe Lazarus is there too and Mary and Martha. It's a big group, right? It's a big table. Remember, these are all just my initial observations. But the text really focuses on just two individuals. The third one is there. Lazarus is not mentioned at all. It's really a focus of a discussion between Jesus and Martha. Jesus and Martha. The story previously was a discussion between a lawyer, one skilled in the Old Testament law, and Jesus. 
So here we have another discussion, and I believe this discussion revolves around priorities. The importance of priorities. It's not a story about a good girl and a bad girl. It's a story about priorities. It's a story about discipleship and priorities. Now, to prioritize is to rank something in, in importance, right? If you prioritize, you're ranking something in importance. So this morning, ranked in importance. Kiss my wife. Good morning. Feed the cat. We got a brand new cat. Ranked in importance. Feed self. No, that comes before the cat. Make coffee. That was right up there. It's a discussion regarding priorities. Let me tell you right off, serving Jesus is a good priority. Serving Jesus is a good priority. I often feel as though Martha gets a bad rap from this passage. Let me ask, when you invite a guest into your home, what's one of the major, one major expectation? You serve them, you feed them. That's what it means to be hospitable. And I believe Martha desired to be a good, hospitable hostess. I think she wanted to be a good, hospitable hostess. She welcomed Jesus into her home. Notice, it's her home. Mary and Lazarus are staying at her home. Was she a widow and that's why she has this home? I don't know. But it's her home. And after all, doesn't God want us all to be hospitable, to practice hospitality? The answer is, yes, here are some scriptures to show that. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and he writes this list. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and what? Practicing hospitality. It's in the list. In chapter 13 of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2, let love of the brethren continue. And then it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without even knowing it. Here we have in that verse, those two verses, love is linked to hospitality. Right back to back. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. And then you have right on the heels of love, what? Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Obviously, the, the writers of Scripture are kind of linking loving people with being hospitable to people. Do you see it? <coughs> so I ask you, is it very possible that Math, Martha wanted to show her love for Jesus by being hospitable? I think yes. Isn't Serving a love language according to Chapman, Gary Chapman. I think Martha wanted to show her love for Jesus by serving him. Perhaps this was her gifted area, service. Maybe it was her strength, service. And in the church, we need Martha's, don't we? How does the work of the Lord get done if we don't have people like Martha doing work, energetically serving the Lord? competent people who get things done. I think Mary desired to be a good, hospitable hostess. And if Mary's strength is service, you have to be careful because it could have some glaring weaknesses. What are the glaring weaknesses in service? Well, people who serve can often be judgmental of those who don't serve as diligently as they do. People who serve can often be judgmental of those who don't serve as diligently as they do. I don't know if Mary was a type A personality or if you're using the DISC, a D-I-S-C personality. I don't know if she was a D, decisive, direct, task-oriented, competent, go-getter, demanding. I don't know if that was her. Probably. 
But it does tell us that I think she noticed Mary wasn't helping. Right? Isn't that 39? She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. And so I ask you, was Martha a little irritated because she was left to do all the work? Just a little bit frustrated with their sister? The answer is yes. After all, 13 guests just entered the home. Who's doing all the work? Martha, what's her sister doing? No work. See, I think people who serve can often be judgmental of those who don't serve as diligently as they do. And secondly, people who serve often lose sight of what's most important. What's most important? In verse 40, it says, Mary was distracted with all of her preparations. That word distracted is a word perispao, and it really means to be pulled away. It means to have one's attention directed from one thing to another. To have your attention directed from one thing to another. It's not that Mary didn't want to sit with Jesus, but her attention was diverted away from him to do the work necessary to serve him. She was distracted, diverted away from Jesus in order to serve him well. See, it's a matter of priorities. And Martha's exercising the wrong one. She lost sight of what's most important. And thirdly, people who serve are often mouthy about those who don't. <laughs> this is true in church world, too. People who serve are often mouthy about those who don't. Martha doesn't come in and say, Mary, can I speak to you in the kitchen for a moment, please? No, she airs her complaint, her gripe, before her honored guest. She's talking to Jesus. I find this amazing. She came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care? <laughs> Who's the most compassionate person in the whole world this world's ever known? Isn't it Jesus? <laughs> Lord, don't you care? <laughs> She's critical of Jesus. Wow. She's critical of her sister. <laughs> Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Don't, don't you care? Look at, look at my deadbeat sister here. <laughs> and then she demands that Jesus right this wrong. She says, she commands Jesus. This is the command. Is this bossy or what? Tell her to help me. She started off with Lord. That was a good start. <laughs> but really, who's Lord in this statement? She's telling the Lord. She's the master of this situation. She is so convinced in her mind she's in the right, right? She's so convinced in her own mind she's in the right. Tell her to help me. See, serving Jesus, let me tell you, is, it's a good priority. But secondly, sitting with Jesus is the highest priority. Serving is good, but sitting with him is the highest priority. It's the great priority. Now, Jesus showed his care for Martha by writing her wrong priority. He showed his care for her. He called her name twice. Martha, Martha, it's not said in disgust. It's actually, when you say the person's name twice or an idea twice, it's really giving you some intense emotion. In Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, 
The Lord Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Simon, Simon, isn't that a tense emotion? I know what Satan's going to do to you, but I'm praying for you. When Saul is on his way to Damascus to uh, lock up the believers in prison, the Lord meets him. And in Acts 9-4, the Lord says, well, it says, And he, Saul, fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's not saying that in disgust. He's saying that with emotion, like, don't you realize what you're doing? In Luke 13, 34, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stoned those who sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Can't you feel the emotion there? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So here when he's saying, Martha, Martha, he's showing just by using her name, that he has compassion. He really does care for her. And he gently pointed out her wrong attitude, her wrong behavior. He says, you are worried. You're anxious. You're bothered. You're troubled or upset about so many things. What was she anxious about? Was it based on fear that she might look like a bad hostess in the eyes of 13 men, one of them being the Lord Jesus? Was she worried about what the neighbors would think, uh, the gossip going around? Hey, did you hear about Martha, how she entertained Jesus? The house was a mess. <laughs> she didn't even clean up. And get this, the food was cold. You're anxious, you're bothered about so many things. By the way, even if Martha prepared no food, isn't Jesus the one who turned water into wine? And didn't he take a couple fish and some bread and feed 5,000? Martha, Martha. He's gently telling Martha, you have the wrong priority. You got the wrong priority. And Jesus showed her that Mary had the right priority in verse 42. Only one thing is necessary, really. One thing is needed. He doesn't define what that one thing is. Instead, he, show, he points to Mary, or he's thinking of Mary. He says, Mary has chosen the good part. She's chosen the good part. What's she doing? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. Mary's posture of sitting at the feet of Jesus is like a rabbi teaching his students. You're sitting at the foot of the rabbi. And I love that Jesus isn't like other rabbis, because other rabbis at that time, would they teach women? No. Jesus welcomes Mary to his feet, and he's speaking his word to her. Mary chose the good part. Some translations look at this as a comparative use of the word good, meaning comparative, Mary has chosen the better part. The better part. Mary chose to be fed by Jesus' words rather than working to feed Jesus. Let me give you my conjecture on this. I believe Mary did help with the kitchen duties. That is, until Jesus entered the house. And you're saying, where do you get that from? Well, Martha's complaint was, she's left me to do all the what? Serving, not the preparing of the food and having the food and making supper. It's the serving of it that she's complaining. But back in John chapter 12, that other 
place where it talks about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It says in chapter 12, verse 2, so they made him a supper there. They made him. Who's the they? Martha and Mary. And then the text goes on to say, now Martha's serving, but Mary wasn't serving. She went to get the costly perfume to anoint the feet of Jesus. They made him suffer. So I really believe that even in Luke chapter 10, Mary is helping Martha at the beginning. But as soon as Jesus walks in the door, I'm done with that. I'm going to sit ahead of his feet. And the Lord says she's chosen the better part. In Deuteronomy 8.3, it says, Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Jesus uses that in the temptation sequence in Matthew 4.4 4 as well. See, Mary chose the better meal to feed upon. It was to hear God's word. And the, and the verse ends with, what she has done will not be taken away from her. What's my theme this morning? Your devotion to Jesus must be a higher priority than your duty to Jesus. Your devotion to Jesus must be a higher priority than your duty to Jesus. I would say it also this way. Worship of Jesus is the higher priority over working for Jesus. Growing up in a, as a new Christian... After receiving Jesus Christ, I was taught early on how to have what's called daily devotions. You know that word, daily devotions? Have you had your daily devotions yet? This meant that I was to spend time with Jesus every day reading God's word, the Bible, and, and then talking back to him in prayer. And God's word usually showed me things I needed to confess, things where I'm off track. God's word usually showed me things that, hey, i got to thank God for this. This is great. Things I needed to help change in my life. God's word showed me things I needed to change in my own life. And so I would talk to Jesus about these very same things in prayer. I'd read God's word, and then I would take God's word, and I would apply it to me, myself, and, and then go to prayer. That's how I'm using devotion. I'm not using devotion as loyalty, fidelity to, or commitment to. I'm using devotion as being in God's presence. There is nothing better than coming into the presence of God, focusing our attention on him and his word. So devotion is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word on a daily basis, daily devotion. This is more important than everything else. It's more important than everything else. Your devotion to Jesus has got to be the highest priority. Warren Wiersbe said, what we do with Jesus is more important than what we do for Jesus. What we do with Jesus. However, let me be as clear as I can when I say sitting with Jesus and serving Jesus are not mutually exclusive. It's not either or. Jesus wants us all to be devoted like Mary, but he also wants us to be servants like Martha. You just have to have the priority in the right order. See, it's wrong to serve Jesus without having a devotional life with Jesus. Right? Jesus even says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot bear fruit apart from me. You need to abide with Jesus. You need to be settled down, remaining with Jesus. You need to have this devotional life with Jesus. And when you have a devotional life with Jesus, you're abiding with him. Now the work you do will bear fruit. Right? So this idea of, well, I can serve him but not have my right heart right with him. Well, you're deluding yourself. It's also wrong 
to be so devoted to Jesus, you're studying God's word all the time, you're going to church all the time, you're listening to podcasts all the time, you've got to enter every Bible study you can, and you're always having this devotion with Jesus, and you never get around to serving him. Because John 15 also says, when you abide with him, you will bear fruit. How do you bear fruit if you're never serving? It's not either or, sitting or serving, it's both. Remember, to prioritize is to rank in importance. To rank in importance. And Jesus is showing Martha and he's showing us what is of the utmost importance. What is of the utmost importance? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. So, brothers and sisters, how are you doing with your priorities? Where does spending time with Jesus rank in importance to you? Do you even have a devotional life? Jesus is telling us, sitting at my feet, listening to me, is the most important thing in life. So let me ask you, what distracts you from choosing the best priority? Right? Martha was distracted. Her attention was turned from this to that. What distracts you from spending time with Jesus every day? Time with family? Is that a good priority, to have time with family? It is a good priority. Is it the best priority? People, is it the best priority? No. What about time working? Is that a good priority? Yes, it's very good. You need to support your family, man. But is it the best priority in life? Your work? No. Students, what about schoolwork and doing your, going to school? Is that a great priority? Yeah, it's a good one. But is that the best priority in life? No. Spending time with Jesus is the best priority. We in America love recreation. I'm not going to list all the things we love doing. Football. Did you spend any time yesterday watching college football? Uh, Iowa, by the way, Jeremy, Iowa, Hawkeyes. Some watch college football all day long on Saturday. Sunday comes along, now it's NFL all day long. Now Cubs are in the playoffs almost. (laughs) You spend time watching things that you enjoy? Yup. Is that a bad priority? Nope. Is it the best priority for a Christian? No. No. What distracts you? Even Christian ministry. I encourage you all to get involved in Christian ministry. But it's not the best priority. If you pulled out your calendar, you looked at your daily planner, where is Jesus in that? What distracts you from choosing the better portion? As I said previously, we need more Marthas in the church. Otherwise, ministry will not get done. We need more Marthas. But let me tell you, we need everyone to be a Mary. We need everyone to be a Mary. We need everyone to be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, in Luke 10 and John 11 and John 12... 
Wherever Mary is mentioned in connection with Jesus, you find him at his feet. In Luke 10, she's at his feet listening to his word. In John chapter 11, Martha comes out to him first and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And, and Jesus said to Martha, he will live again. And she said, yeah, I know he'll live in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this, Martha? I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Martha had a great confession of faith. And then Martha goes back to the house and says, the teacher is calling for you, Mary. And Mary comes out, and the first thing she does is fall to the feet of Jesus. In John chapter 12, after they had supper, Mary falls to the feet of Jesus, anoints his feet with oil, wipes it with her hair. Mary's a worshiper of Jesus. You know the slogan, be like Mike, long time ago, right? Be like Michael Jordan, be like Mike. I'm telling you, be like Mary. We need Marthas, we want everyone to serve, but we want everyone to spend time with Jesus daily. Correct? Father, we come before you. I thank you that this object lesson that Mary and Martha had played out at, in the home of Martha, it's really all about priorities. Lord, you've been speaking to each one of us I hope you've made it clear through my teaching that the word of God is clear that we are all to be at the foot of Jesus, listening to his word. You've given us the scriptures, you've given us the holy word. Forgive us for the times we're distracted, we do so many things, so many things that fill up our day and we never get around to spending time with Jesus. Forgive us. Now change us. Help us to see this as the great priority in life, to abide with Jesus. We pray this in his name.